from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. I'm Henry Glassy. I'm Douglas Dowling Peach. And I'm Cliff Murphy, and we're here today with a group of musicians from the Maryland, Pennsylvania, Delaware tri state region along the Mason Dixon line. Uh, everybody that we're here with today is uh, part of a musical tradition and legacy of the Appalachian migration. Uh, and I would love for everybody to, uh, to introduce yourselves. We know how you all fit together, but um, if you wouldn't mind uh, introducing yourselves and kind of helping us to understand uh, who you are and, and what, this, uh, what this tradition is that you come out of. And I guess a good place to start uh, maybe would be with uh, Mr. Dave Reed. Hello, my name is David Reed. I'm Danny Paisley. Hi, I'm Ryan Paisley. Hi, my name's Michael Paisley. My name's Hugh Campbell. Hi, I'm T.J. Lundy. So, Dave, tell us a little bit about yourself as a musician and maybe about your family as well. How did you, uh, how did you get Start involved in playing music? Yeah. Well, this story might be, might be a little bit different than what you might expect. <clears throat> One day, I was at home and my brother's electric guitar was sitting on the couch. So was his amplifier. So... Since he was, since my brother was not there, I picked up the guitar and I said, well, I'm gonna play around with this thing since he ain't here, so I, I can do what I want. So I picked it up, started playing with it. Next thing I know, I thought, hey, I think I can do this. Then I made up a song. And it was, I, then I started playing the rock music and uh, for about four years. Then, one day at Camel's Corner where mom and Alex had the store, their grocery store, this was uh, about 1969, I seen a young man in the back of the store where they used to have music, they used to have bluegrass groups and so forth, in the back of the store I seen him playing bluegrass guitar. So uh, just for fun, I thought, well, I wanna, I'm going to take a guitar off, off, off the wall because they used to sell guitars up there. So I took advantage of that and I, you know, I had free leeway to get what I wanted. So I took, took the guitar and started playing around with it. And I thought, well, hmm, maybe I can play this music. The next thing I knew, somehow or other, mom and I got together, you know, Olabelle, and she had her banjo and uh, I happened to have a guitar. Somehow, I don't know exactly how that ha we got together, but I remember where it was. There was a meat case where they used to slice lunch meat, and right back of there. And we got together, and we started playing. <clears throat> Mom never criticized me for playing my rock music, never, or anything else. That was one of the best things she ever done for me. It's not knock me, and Dad didn't either. He left me and let me run my course. My Jimmy Hendrix and all this other kind of stuff, you know. And, uh, then anyhow, we started playing together. So I automatically took to her music right then and there. That was 1969, just before um, they were invited to the Festival of American Folk Life in 1969. And I remember John, a mom was playing a song, uh, it was John, John Hardy. So she was playing her style. And then I, I was finding myself playing the same similar notes that she was playing. And she got so excited. John Miller, was, he was there. He was, he was there uh, on the back of the meat case also, and, you know, on down further. And she said, hey, John, come listen here. Come listen to this. And she was so happy. She didn't know how to, she was beside herself. So, and the next thing you know, uh, we were playing together. And, and I still had my rock and roll band. I was playing from the oldest to the, to the, to the, to the newest music. I enjoyed it. So I kind of hung around, you know. For, for people who, don't, uh, who, who didn't know your, your mother um, or your uncle, can you kind of introduce us to them, to, to Olabelle and Alex? Uh, as a team, as a team, you, you, you could not separate them. Um, 
you know, the camels are very family oriented. There's nothing wrong with that. But them two is to either to talk to each other or do their music and so forth. You could not separate them. The rest of the family was, you know, there wasn't into the music. Their brothers and sisters was not into the music, except my uncle Herb, and he wrote some Don't You Call My Name and some other songs that Del McCurry recorded in 1972, and it was released in 73, but, but you couldn't separate them two. <clears throat> make any difference. It didn't make any difference if it was Sunset Park, New River Ranch, Camel's Corner, the band, couldn't separate them at all. Danny, if you wouldn't mind kind of telling us who you are and, uh, and, and how you fit into this picture. I'm uh, Danny Paisley. I have a bluegrass band that uh, I've been a part of for close to 40 years or over. It was originally uh, started with uh, Ted Lundy and Bob Paisley. And Bob Paisley being my fam father. And that's how I got started playing bluegrass music with them. Over the years, as it uh, developed along, Ted passed away and Dad kept playing, and I traveled the United States and Canada and Europe with my father, and uh, he passed away in 2004, and I'm still keeping, keeping at it. <laughs> now, your father, um, your father had a connection to My Willow father, and... uh, uncle, played in a gr group of musicians up in Maryland and Pennsylvania called the North Carolina Ridge Runners. Oh, wow. They were a group of Southerners, pretty much how I got started, from North Carolina. Uh, they all were transplants. So they named the band the North Carolina Ridge Runners. My uncle Wally played in that band. So dad would go to hear them practice. And David's mom, Olabel Reed, was uh, the banjo player and singer and the guitar player. And Olabel would uh, take Dad and set him up on his knee. And she had a repertoire of a lot of old, My God. cute songs that she would sing to him. And we have a picture at home of Dad sitting on a very young Olabel's lap. <laughs> wow. And so over the years, <clears throat> we all played music together, became friends. Mm -hmm. Uh, hung out at Sunset Park and folk festivals yes, all across indeed. the United States. I believe it. So yeah. we uh, didn't really play in a band together, but we all enjoyed each other's music and really respected each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, then now comes my son. Yeah, so now history is repeating itself a little <laughs> bit. Um, Ryan, tell us about yourself. Uh, well, my name is Brian Paisley. I'm a mandolin player. Um, this is my dad, Danny, and I started playing music because I just heard it all around the house. We, my grandmother, when we were there, she would always have some type of music playing if she was not playing the piano. And naturally, I just fell into, because being so used to hearing music, I wanted to play music. So I, I had, um, my grandmother gave me a rolling pin one time, and I sat there and just did like that and acted like I was playing a fiddle until, um, Someone gave me a cardboard fiddle that had no string. <laughs> and I would sit there with a little bow that had no horse hair or anything on it, just to let do that. that. And then one day, I just remember um, just watching my dad's concert, and mm -hmm. I heard his mandolin player at, at the time, Donnie Eldris, was playing, and I just looked and fell in love with the mandolin. And my uncle, uh, my mom's side, gave me one, and I played it ever since. All right. Michael, uh, Uncle Mike. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> Sounds good anyway. <laughs> yeah, I got started with Dad and Danny. We're at, at a time when they were looking for a bass player. And uh, I agreed to try. I never played. I always listened to the music, traveled with them to festivals and all. So I kind of had an idea of what it's supposed to sound like. But could I make it sound that way? It's, <laughs> it took a little while to take <laughs> and a lot of on road practice. I think the first job I played was in Belmont Park in New York at the horse track. I oh, was scared to death. <laughs> but, <laughs> and I just, I don't know, never got off that trail and just kept on going until recently I decided to retire from music and spend more time with my grandchildren. Mm. But uh, they all too have interests in so many. Someday they might play. We'll find out. Sure. Yeah. 
And now here, you're, you've got a family connection here as well, right? We grew up hearing music of all kinds, really. Uh, Olabel was my aunt, my father's younger sister, and Alex was his, his younger brother. Many of them played music, but Alex and Olabel were more, more out there actually doing it for a living. But uh, my brother and I, Zane, we, uh, we started writing songs and playing music early on. Uh, we came along in the, the, the mid-late 1960s when, you know, there were a lot of singer-songwriter out, uh, people out doing their thing. And uh, we also had the bluegrass old-time influence and also the rock and roll influence. So <clears throat> it was just a very natural thing. And uh, by the time the 60s came around, it was... You know, many years before, you, you generally played traditional songs in, in, in bluegrass music, but uh, we kind of got permission from Olabel and Alex and Herb and uh, lots of folks in our family to just write your own songs, which we started doing and enjoyed it. And uh, I got away from music for some time. Zane stayed in it in New York. <clears throat> And uh, later, when I was in my early 30s, I moved to Austin, Texas, lived down there and, and tried the, the troubadour, troubadour routine for a while until I was about to starve to death, of course, and uh, came back up here and then started to get back, back into old time and bluegrass music again. And uh, we just sort of wound up here today. Uh, when that was going on up in our little place in Childs, Cliff, you started coming around, showing some interest, and of course that that sparked more interest in us, and we continued on, and uh, here we are today. All right, now TJ, you're, again, the family <laughs> connections here. Tell yeah, us. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So it's gonna be a similar story, I, I sense. Yeah, um, uh, hi, I'm TJ Lundy. Um, uh, like Danny was saying earlier, my father uh, was a banjo player from Galax area. Um, came up up to Delaware following his brother for work back in the no, probably mid 50s um, came up you know looking for you know for work to begin with but he also found other people around this area that had come up before him like like David's mother you know up, he used to get his sunset park and got connected up with Olabel and Alec and um, played some with them back early on and then being in the early 60s. Um, of course, m you know, me being a little boy, he'd always bring, you know, all the kids around and we grew up at Sunset Park every Sunday. <laughs> mm -hmm. That was, you know, we looked forward to that every Sunday to, you know, we saw all the big country stars come through and s seeing George Jones not show up how many times? Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> am I right there? Yes, sir. And, uh, but yeah, it was like a, a family outing for us, you know, every Sunday. And uh, so, you know, just being, just being that, as just being around the music all the time, it just kind of wore off on us naturally, you know. It, you know, they would play music and they would set their instruments down and hear us kids would pick them up and <laughs> beat and strum and bang. And, <laughs> you know, That's what it was. And strumming and banging, we do that still today. <laughs> But we have fun, and uh, and we we all got connected up through that through our music. You know, if it probably wasn't for the music, we might not know each other. But uh, it's worked out for, uh, real good for me, and I hope for the rest of the guys. <laughs> and, uh, that's how I got here. I all right. So, yeah. Well, Henry, I'm going to turn it over to you. Things are moving so smoothly, I'd like to just continue you all talking in the same way that you are now. But let me imagine a, a slightly different inflection, and that is you're first asked to talk about connections. I'd really like to hear each of you talk about how you became as good as you are. Ryan, I'm looking right at you and saying, oh. how did you get this good? And what I'm thinking about is teachers, and I'm thinking about inspiration, maybe some record that just burned your brain. But I'd, I'd like people to think about just who were those people or who were those inspirational people that helped you get where you are today? Well, I would say after that, like I was saying earlier when I heard the, I call him Uncle Donnie, Donnie Eldreth, 
um, once I heard that, that mandolin sound, I just started, I looked anywhere else that I could hear that. And I found Bill Monroe and I got the um, homespun Bill Monroe teaching DVD <laughs> with the tablature and learned the tablature. And then after I did that, I Ronnie McCurry, who, um, probably my biggest mandolin hero of all. And every day I would just sit down and try to f figure that out and try and turn that and see how I could make that into my own and see how I could transform it. And I just did that every day and just continue to do it every time I can when I'm sitting around the house, whether it's 8.30 in the morning or 11.30 <laughs> at night. If I've got an extra second, I will be with the mandolin or the banjo or the guitar or something. I think that's a wonderful answer. I'd, every, I'd like everybody to think in exactly those terms because if you, if you have one shot, I remember I once met a great poet and I had one question, who was your favorite poet? And there's all kind of information and so that you, you know, so you say Ronnie McCoury, that's just a wonderful answer. I wish Burl Kilby were here today. <coughs> we miss Burl, but I asked him that question and he said J.D. Crow. Mm -hmm. See, that's just really helpful. It's really insightful. So Danny, would you take it away from that point? And For me, truly, it was my father yeah. when he sang real high pitch, much in the style of uh, uh, Bill Monroe, but he had sort of a mountain yeah. edge to it. Uh, and he played with a thumb pick. <coughs> I noticed so, that you did too. Yeah, yeah, and I do to <coughs> this day, and it was just around home. But my father, I always thought, was the greatest singer because he sang these tunes real high like Bill Monroe. We, yeah. we only had a few records around home when we were young because you had to save your money. It was a special thing to buy a record. So uh, to hear him and TJ's father, Ted Lundy, that was my inspiration. And from the time I was a little kid, like talking four or five, I sat in the middle of the practice circle that they would have in somebody's living room. I'd be in the, in the middle of it, just, just amazed. And uh, to this day, I hear that music right in my, right in my face. Yeah. And uh, that's what gets me excited. Uh, I appreciate music today, but that's music of that era. Back in the early 60s, it's just, to me, it just grabs me. So yeah. that was mine. That's great. <laughs> I'd love to say that that's exactly the thing that Ola Bell told me. But she said she would sit when she'd worked real hard all day uh -huh. in, in Campbell's Corner. And she'd come home and she'd be weary and worn mm -hmm. out. And she'd just go back in her mind and she'd hear the music yeah. of her childhood. Yes. Mm -hmm. And yes. she said that sustained her and kept her sane through yeah. her life. We can go today and something will be, somebody will talk about something or say <clears> something <throat> or mention a song. And I can immediately go back to hearing our fathers play it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, be someone else's song or, but I can immediately, that's my base and that's my inspiration. I just love that sound. And I'll never capture it, but I w I'm constantly trying to. <laughs> well, I think, I think it's a way of, Danny and I said, I'm including you in this group, I think that's a way of great artists. You never quite get there, but you've got a star in but front you, of you. You got to, music constantly evolves, but you, like for me, the music of that Galax, I call Galax Bluegrass, uh, that's, I love that. That's what gets me excited. It's based on mountain hoedowns and right. the banjo style, and that's what I love. <laughs> Got that old love sound it. still and inside. And like Bell singing one of her, I'm Longing for a Love, mm -hmm. one of her old songs like that, just to hear her in her voice almost crying for yeah. something she can have and out of respect for that couple of not uh, going too far out of the bounds uh, and yeah. keeping loyal, she, you know, but to hear that in her voice, that uh, I love that. That's music to me. I love that. It's not whether they're on key, perfect pitch. Or, yeah. I love that. <laughs> full of heart. Full yes. of it's real human. Mm -hmm. Dave? Well, um, as being the son of Old Bell, how else, who else could I say? <laughs> but my biggest inspiration was my mom. She was my mother. But we had a relationship. I, I, I don't know if you want to go all up into this. But we had, between us two, was a relationship and I'll say it, I was a mama's boy, and, and I, I know I was the apple of her eye. Mm -hmm. That means me more than, than even all her music, but she inspired me, but I was also inspired 
when I first learned how to play rock and roll, I don't know if I ought to go up, but you ask a question, so I'm going to give you an yeah. answer. Yeah, we so, want it. But I was inspired by groups like the Beatles. I was inspired by groups by Beach Boys. Um, I was inspired by uh, guitar players. Before I started playing bluegrass, now this is before. So that's, this is where I got my start. And, and uh, by guitar players uh, like Eric Clapton, um, Jimi Hendrix, uh, and uh, Jimmy Page, as far as electric guitar. But then I was introduced, uh, this, this good friend of ours by the name of Victor of Dalkamov. He got me into, introduced to playing bluegrass, but I was playing the rock music and I was also playing with my mom, which is the old timey, and there is a difference in the sound but it, to me, you, you know, you, you can't hardly separate those styles. They need to be together because it's too similar. Just because they're played differently, the chords changes and everything are basically the same. Mostly the same. It's just the tempo may be a little bit different. Uh, but anyhow, Victor uh, put on uh, Ralph Stanley and the Clinch Mountain Boys, <laughs> 1971. Cry from the cross. And when I heard that, I thought, oh, that guitar. I love that guitar with Keith Whitley. And I was also, if you're talking about, if you're going to the banjo, I was inspired, of course, by my mother, with the claw hammer, and you go to the three finger style. Of course, uh, Mr. Earl Scruggs is, uh, <laughs> you know, um, the man who uh, just, just, just got it going for all the three finger style banjo players. And uh, also, Alex, well, Alex influenced me a whole lot. We'd sit, I'd go down to his house, and we'd sit down there, and we'd be kidding and teasing and having a blast, and then we'd get serious. He'd start talking about Bell Monroe. We'd start talking about him. Then he'd go to Flat and Scruggs. We'd start talking about them. He'd go to Henry and Red Smiley. They're highly influential bluegrass groups. And the Stanley Brothers. I think those four groups are the most influential groups to ever be in bluegrass music. That's just my opinion. But that influenced me in the bluegrass way. Of course, the, the, with my mother inspired me to, um, she'd get in front of a crowd. And I, I've been doing churches for years. And what I have found that what has worked for me is singing these gospel songs, these older gospel songs, to these older people, they'll just sit back and they just act like they want to sing. That's the most rewarding part of it. You know what I mean? When watching my mother do this, I thought, man, that's, that's what I like to do. And I didn't know if I could do it or not, you know. And I got into a church one day and we got praising the Lord and stuff. And next thing you know, everybody started singing. It changed my, changed my life. But I'll tell you something else that really inspired me to want to to do something, you know, more like on my own. 1976, and Danny remembers, he remembers, we shared a room at the Festival of American Folk Lab 1976. Mom wasn't feeling well. And so Ralph Rensler asked my father to come do like a Jimmy Rogers set or blues or whatever one it was. So we go there and it was just him and I, it was minus my mother. And, uh, I just, you know, up there, I just, I, I thought, let dad do all the talking. I ain't, I ain't saying anything. I ain't saying a word. <laughs> let him take care of this whole thing. <clears throat> and we got going. And then I, I played a banjo tune. And then I thought, hey, let's just do the world circle and be unbroken like what mom does. We did that. And the people started singing along. And I'm going, wow, this, this is an incredible feeling. I thought, well, so dad turned me loose. And I just kind of learned to play the banjo. And, uh, <laughs> So I'll never forget it. To end, to end that show, we got up there and we did Sally Gooden. And the people were started drifting in more and more coming in, more and more. And I looked up there and I said, where in the world all these people come from? And everybody laughed at me. I go, oh, wow, this feels good. <laughs> and then so we started, we started that Sally Gooden. So by watching other people, I thought, I'm going to kick this thing in high gear before I get done, just to see what they do. So I kicked that thing in high gear, and everybody just went crazy. And that was it. That was it. I fell in love. That was 1976. I'll never forget it. That was 
one of the most fun times of my entire life ever. I better shut up and let somebody else talk. You are your own inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> oh my. That That's wonderful, fun. though. Great. That was fun. Yeah. TJ, would you like to kick into this story? Well, yeah. Well, I have a lot of inspirations, but it all started with my dad and, and Bob. And uh, like Danny was saying, just being around as a little kid. Uh, you know, that, just being inspired by just being around it and feeling it. Um, you, you can't get that anywhere you know, off a record player. Mm -mm. No. Um, so just that vibration, you know, being in my head right in that banjo or that guitar, <laughs> it was like beat into my brain and, and you can't get it out. Mm -hmm. It's not, you're not gonna get it out of my head. Um, but you know, with dad being a musician and all, he had, you know, of course he had inspirations himself and kind of, you know, pushed, not pushed him, but introduced me to other, you know, music, you know, country music, uh, old time music. Um, Dad, he liked all kinds of music, just like I do today. I, I you know, I, I can only play one kind, but I, I, I respect everybody's yeah. uh, musical taste and abilities because, you know, I like rock and roll, I like jazz, I like old time, I like bluegrass, I like it all. There's only, you know, I like it all. But as a kid growing up, my, you know, I had like Kenny Baker as a, you know, as a fiddle player. Mm -hmm. yeah. Of course, Bill Monroe and Stanley Brothers and you know, Flat and Scruggs. And, and um, it just, God, it just goes on and on. You know, like Tommy Jarrell and Kyle Creed. Yeah. Dad was always, you know, he was friends with them. So when they would get together, I would hear that. And that was, that was, some of my inspiration in that, I, just <clears> playing <throat> some old time fiddle tunes or, or you know, any, like I said, I like all, all music and, and I, I wish I could play other styles, but yeah, I, I'm, I can't but, and I accept that and I just do what I do as best as I can and, <laughs> and uh, enjoy what I have. And uh, so, that's, you know, like I said, it's all I, I, I like. I love bluegrass, and, and I love to play it. And can't get it out of me. Mm -hmm. Can't nobody get take it from me. That's it. <laughs> Nobody'd want to, man. You've got it. <laughs> That's right. But I think it's wonderful to hear just hear the names. You and Tommy Gerald and Kenny Baker. Just to uh, hear those names because it's important for these people that have gone before to yeah. still be a part of our minds and yeah. still be a part of our thought. But I love your saying that you love you play one kind of music, but you love all kinds. I do. Ola Bell said exactly that same thing. Yeah. There was an interview with her after she and Alec had played at WASA in Haverty Grace for ten years. There was an interview of the two of them, and. They asked Alex, what kind of music do you like? He said, I like bluegrass. I said, Olabel, what kind do you like? She said, I love all music. Yeah. It was a wonderful answer. She had her own music. Yeah, right. But it was right in the center of an entire universe of musical possibility. Yeah. That's, yes, sir. <coughs> yeah. Did you want to say something, Dave? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> I'm listening. I'm agreeing with you. I'm amen in you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we could get a witness. Well, we're going to shift on to Hugh now, but... Uh, you have a wonderful diversity of music in your background. That's really the, the fact. I mean, you've come into this country music, but at the same time, you were in Austin and experienced all these different things. And, and out of it, it seemed to me, you created a really wonderfully, highly individual sense of poetry as well as music. And I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about that. I'd like TJ, I like all kinds of music. I listen to all kinds of music. Coming up, it was always rock and roll. And even all the way back to Hootenanny, we used to look at that on wow. television. <laughs> But I love those folk songs, you know. And uh, <clears throat> as it went on, uh, the, the lyrics, the poetry came to me far sooner than the music did. In fourth grade, I have a distinct memory of uh, a teacher of ours when it came to grammar and English. Uh, she would give each student, she would give the students a list of words, say a dozen words. Homework was to write a quick story using those words. And uh, <clears throat> not only did I find it fun and fascinating, I realized at that early age that I was very good at that. She, she brought it to my attention more than once, saying, do you notice how quiet 
your fellow students get when you start reading your story. Everybody would write their story and you go around a circle and everybody would read it in class. That's the first time I noticed I had a little bit of a gift for, for words. And then as I went on, it, it still, is, still is the dominant feature if I try to write a song. It's more about the words and conveying a feeling or an image and emotion in three minutes. Or a little longer in a short story. I like short stories. Novels I get lost in, but short stories and songs is a challenge to, to try to convey an idea just in three minutes. And then when I got older and I started putting a little music to it, it took on another dimension, but uh, that's, that's the way we've always been more focused, I think, as I say we and my younger brother and I, as writing the songs. And then, of course, we were influenced by the 60s and 70s with, you know, Jim Croce and John Prine and all those names that people of my era recognize. And, uh, you know, we, we were youngsters ourselves. We wanted to be like those guys writing those songs. And then, you know, that's those people and that kind of uh, that kind of a take on songs and music were always what inspired me if I could uh, you know the, the, the first time I went in front of a crowd and actually presented a full set of my own songs and taken that crowd from you know from multiple emotions from laughing and hooting about something stupid I just doing on the guitar and, and matching it up with words to something that could bring, bring folks to a tear. That's what inspired me to continue on with music. If you can do that, if people are actually interested in coming to hear you do that and give them that, <clears throat> I can do it. I like to do that. I like to go and give them that. But as far as the music goes, I think these guys will all attest, I got a ways to go yet. <laughs> Am I right? <laughs> Tell Huey's okay. That's it. We say nothing. We they've, been, they've been humoring old Hugh for the last two weeks. I, I not, <laughs> not a bit. But I, I think it's really important to bring up the words because for Olabel, that was, those were crucial. Mm. She was much more, I think she was, if you compared her to the normal, let's say, bluegrass musician, she cared a great deal more about enunciation. Oh, yeah. Very, very clear. She cared greatly about the poetry in the songs. And when... When she began to, in the mid-60s, began to turn back to old music, it wasn't out of some kind of sentimental interest in old music so much as it was an interest in very fine poetry. Yeah. And the fact is that poetry, and it was the same thing with gospel songs. One of the reasons she loved gospel songs was for the religious reason. The second one was philosophical that wasn't really religious, but the third one was poetic. Mm -hmm. She talked very elegantly about how beautiful the poetry was in many great gospel songs, and that's just true. So if you're, you know, so that coming, I think your emphasis on the words is a very important mm -hmm. fact of our appreciation of Ola Bell and this whole tradition, that one of the things is, you all are a bunch of great musicians without question, but it's also true that this, this tradition has a fantastic acts as a poetry and that you've well, worked in that. that what you said right there mom that mom wasn't an educated person she never finished high school so mm -hmm. i'll just stop i'll stop there but i just want everybody to know that it came natural to her and i think listening to those old songs she wrote she listened to the old songs and so she wrote songs learned those songs of that style so she wrote the song the style of a hundred years or more ago that's right so she could pick up that old style and make it her own i mean she she only lacked one year of graduating from high school, though. She yeah, got yeah, real yeah. close. <laughs> but she said the one thing she could always do as a child was memorize poetry. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think for Olabel that it's maybe more like you. I think it maybe the words might have come first. And then the, the music began to sort of sing the tune that went with the words when she was composing herself. I, I believe you're correct because you captured that on the CD. I believe it's Ivan Dord where they mm -hmm. are kind of talking words and practicing. Yeah, right. yes. And she mm -hmm. mentions about the words and <clears throat> the, the music, and they do it two or three different ways. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, like mm -hmm. the words are way more important than music. the melody of the song. I, th I think for, for all, her. not for everybody, but I think that it's just important to yes. remember the, the, the complexity of the whole, that this is a threading together of wonderful music, but wonderful poetry. Right, the, right. The glory of it. 
you're at the end and you're playing the bass and you're, well, you're standing up there I could the make bass. this short. I concur with you, all these. Do you have any great <laughs> bass player in your mind? <laughs> I like rhythm. I played trumpet or cornet in high school. Oh, see, that's real interesting. And lead instrument. But when I got to play bass, the rhythm, when you got two guitar players standing in front of you, you better learn quick. <laughs> you better have some power or you're going to have this little. <laughs> yeah. so, and Earl Yeager, Bill Grable, they were big influence, the, the selection of their notes, what they play. Yeah. And I always listened to old country music, traditional country music. And uh, some of the, I don't know all the bass players' names, but you hear it in your head. Yes, that's right. And when right. you play a song, maybe the first time you're, you're thinking what you want to play, you might not be playing it at the time, but it, in, eventually in time it comes to you and it just works into the song. But uh, something about rhythm, it's, it's powerful. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And it, you can feel pretty bad some days playing, but once you get started, you, this music just makes, makes you feel pretty this, wonderful. Yeah. yeah. That's pretty much it. That's wonderful. Well, Doug, do you want to have a I line just, of uh, grilling of these gentlemen? <laughs> oh, yeah, let's grill away. Um, <laughs> so we've talked a little bit about you as individuals, and we've talked about your influences, and one of the things that we've just touched on a little bit but I'd like to talk about more is your audiences. And I'm really interested in this phenomenon of, we're, you know, we're talking about Olabel and being raised in the Southern Mountains and moving to the tri-state area. And Olabel stayed in that area, and we performed around a little bit, but particularly uh, you guys and the other uh, touring musicians have had the chance to actually go back down and play in places mm -hmm. like Galax and play in places like Ash County. Mm -hmm. So I'm really interested in the audience reaction to you coming and playing that music in that place. We go south quite a bit. Uh, to play, and you'll always get a comment sometime, you Yankees can play pretty good music. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a joke, but people don't understand. I always say, there's probably more bluegrass in that. Rising Sun, Maryland, Elkton, Maryland, Wilmington, Delaware, Pennsylvania, all stretching out across the uh, Chester County in Pennsylvania to York County, uh, Pennsylvania. In that border area, there's probably more bluegrass and old time music than they have down south in a lot of places because it being far away from the south, we don't take it for granted. Mm -hmm. We take great pride in knowing these songs and playing. We foster friendships with people. So I think uh, uh, we're proud of that. But as far as traveling, I've been to Europe uh, and Japan. We have playing and uh, it amazes me. We can go someplace in Bavarian uh, Alps in Germany to, uh, and somebody's got a CD or a record and you think, how in the world do they know anything about this? <laughs> You know, and uh, uh, of course with the internet now, that's all opened up, but uh, sure. years back, I, w I was always amazed at that, you know, that, that somebody could hear you play this kind of music and know it, and know, sometimes know more about you than you know about you. Yeah, that's right, right. But that's quite an honor right. that somebody cares that much uh, to take that time out of all of our busy schedules to to really dig into the music and learn these songs and are very proud to play them for you when you're in a different country and right. even here we go to california and they'll know all our material before we get there yeah <laughs> one of our uh colleagues i'm talking about cliff and Henry and myself is named John Kay, and he's the state folklorist in Indiana. And he thinks about bluegrass, particularly as being a, a, a music of diaspora. It's folks leaving the mountains, yes. leaving that area, and yes. therefore it's a diaspora, and that's how it's connected to bluegrass. <laughs> it's yeah. true. It's a really interesting idea. Yeah. You've got to have bluegrass in Detroit, or you kill yourself. You, you really? <laughs> think about it. They, they all on the moved, internet. Much like here, they moved there for yeah. employment. Sure. And they had to have a cash income. That's right. Yeah. So. You know, unlike down south where things based on a, I always said the barter system where they were based on trades and 
and things and where there wasn't cash. So the, a lot of them, like my grandparents, they moved to Pennsylvania because they needed a cash income. Mm -hmm. They were sharecroppers, but got a little income, which led to leaving the sharecropper to having their own farm. Mm -hmm. Then you're, you have money to buy records. So you can hear Gid Tanner and, yeah. and all these old, uh, you know, uh, as, songs. As a buy records. <laughs> as a part of this project, we uh, went to Ash County and did some field work with John Miller and interviewed mm -hmm. John and got to see him. And uh, we went to a restaurant there and they were still have they still had IOUs at the restaurant in Ash County. <laughs> <laughs> wow. It's amazing, you know. Mm -hmm. We could never do that up here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anybody else would like to speak about audiences, about reactions to your music? Dave? In your local area, uh, this is what I have found. Uh, they don't pay you a whole lot of mind. And I remember that there was a day. My mother, uh, there was people that liked, liked her music, but I, I, you know, I think she would just, as a matter of fact, my brother used to get in fights because different ones at school and teachers would poke fun of mom for being a hillbilly. Oh, mm. So he'd get in fights over that. Now, since she has a name, it's like, oh, all about, all about, all about, all about. You know, that's what it is. And, I, but I have found this, that doing my music there in the local area, it's few show up, you know, and most of them leave. <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, like a lot of the churches and things, and, and you know, they, they have me come in and sing, but it seems like when I get, get away from home, it's a different reaction. And that's exactly what happened, Henry, when you introduced her to the folk crowds. It was a totally different world of people. And like mom says on her records, now, that the hippie people of the day, and I don't mean that in a bad way, because I'm definitely one. Young no question, yeah, yeah, the young people. Yeah. And we started doing these. As a matter of fact, when we come to that first uh, Festival of American Folk Club, 1969, it's like a different world. These people really appreciate it. I'm going, wow. And uh, I know we're supposed to about speak about ourselves, but if you're talking about audiences, I remember uh, this was about right now, 1970. A man by the name of Josh, Jung, Josh Dunson booked my mother. Of course, Dad and I was there, and Alex was there, and a few other people were there. We played in this hall. I don't know what it was called. I was 17. When we got done, these people flocked around my mother like she was a national star. First time I ever seen it. First time I ever seen it like that. Never seen it like that. I'm going, Mom, Mom, these people around you, like, yeah, I was thinking this. These people around you like, like a Nashville star. And we could be, you know, I'm not saying this in a bad reflection about Sunset Park. The people up there treated us great. But we could be playing up there, the band. Be right in the middle of Orange Blossom Special or whatever. We could be playing. Now, I, I could see, we could all see all the way up to where the booth was. Ticket booth. And I could tell where the main star from the day would be coming down. And they'd say, pull down through there. And the, sometimes the pavilion would be filled because you had a big time country star coming in. Soon as somebody got eye of it, about 90% of the people would run out to go where the star was and we'd be right in the middle of a song. <laughs> and I mean, the band up there, they, I suppose what it was, you know, they, we were up there, played three times a Sunday for years and years and years. But now I just, I just think, what would this crowd give if God could allow Mom and Alex and the band to come back like they were at that time. How much, how many people would show up for that? Because hmm. I have a bunch of, I, I guess hundreds, literally hundreds of people tell me about, I remember New River Ranch. I remember Sunset Park. I remember Campbell's Corner. I remember the stage in the back where they used to play. I remember uh, the broadcast. It's almost, you know, uh, it's just over and over and over again and again. It's just sometimes people just don't realize. And it took somebody like you to come along, Henry. You to come along. Discover her and put her into new places, new faces. That was the best, most appreciation my mother ever got. Thanks to you. 
and YouTube clip and, and YouTube Doug for doing this doing this book. And I'm gonna tell you this is being recorded, and I'm gonna tell you all three right now how much I appreciate this very much. It means the world to me to you three to be doing this book. And it was a it's a great book. I think it's the best project I've been done on my mother. And that's my opinion, but that's just the way I feel. Thank you all very much. Well thank you thank very you much. Did. You did. Appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll shut up. No, 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 that's wonderful. I, I think it's interesting to think about this, this good question that Doug had about audience, because you, you mentioned Earl Scruggs a little bit earlier. And I happened to be when Earl gave a talk at the Country Music Hall of Fame. It was a kind of a wonderful moment when he said, and he said the greatest audience he ever had in his life was in Dublin, Ireland. Wow. And he said it was, he, because it was a deep connection. Yeah between Ireland and the mountains oh, yeah. that just yeah. came right up like that. He said the people didn't know anything about bluegrass and nothing about banjo, but when he walked into Dublin, he said he'd never had an audience like that because it was like he'd gone down to the roots that connected yes. Ireland with the South yeah. and just pulled them right up, made them into the, brought them into the oh, sun. Yeah. And so it seemed to me like there are certain moments like Earl's moment in Dublin yes. that probably all of you had, yes. like one great performance yes. moment. I, I think that'd be a good way to answer that kind of audience. You, like, TG, could you think of some time, I mean, your fiddling is so good. Can you think of one time that you kind of took off in a special way? And I must have been about seven. And out come walking Bill Monroe with his mandolin and played his team with his and I just got so starstruck, I couldn't play. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great memory. <laughs> I couldn't play. I didn't know any. I couldn't even see the audience. All I could see was this giant man. Yeah. <laughs> and I was just, my mouth was wide open. And it was like, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> I couldn't do anything. <laughs> but uh, I, I do remember... Uh, people coming up and it's like all and over like, oh, you got to play with Bill Monroe. Well, I got to stand next to him and, <laughs> and can't remember anything after that. <laughs> but that was probably a, 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 probably a good memory as far as me of being in the audience of him on stage. So I'll just go to say that. <laughs> I think that's touching when uh, Dave was talking about the Smithsonian Folk Festival, and mm -hmm. when I asked Johnny Miller about Smithsonian Folk, he said, I got to play with Kenny Baker. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Who cares about the Smithsonian? Who cares about Washington, D.C.? Yeah. Who cares about any of this? Man, I got to play with yeah. Kenny Baker. Yeah. That, that made the whole stupid thing worth it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 good for me. <laughs> when I first moved down to Austin, Texas, uh, you know, there were a lot of great songwriters living down there and playing. and pitching songs and and uh, you know nobody ever heard of me but I started going out and hitting some of the places and playing and and a uh, couple of the songs were were getting some attention and uh, the next thing I know there was uh, I was featured on a show and uh, there turned out this huge crowd to see this this new person in town and uh, it was just a, I don't even know how to explain it, but uh, it was just a real connection. And being in a town where songwriting is very, very important, Austin, Texas, if you, get, if you can get more than three people out to listen to you, you're, you're going <laughs> on pretty good. <laughs> so I was very flattered by it all and inspired by it all and, uh, and just kept doing what I was doing. I kept writing songs and pitching them around and... Uh, of course, at the time, country music, which I was shooting for, was coming back to new country. It was more like, it didn't sound anything like the 60s, you know. And uh, my songs were just more folky than country. So, but, you know, I, I stayed and hung out, and I was already in my early 30s. So, you know, by the time you're, you, you, you're sweating all week make, trying to make the rent payment and... Uh, buy some groceries. I was just getting tired of it. But that one night, uh, I felt like uh, that, that was enough to keep me going a little bit. But, uh, you know, there have been a lot of fun nights since then, but that was the first one I remember being so inspired to continue on when a town like Austin accepts you as one of, one of their new people. Mm -hmm. 
It's a, it's a certain oh. qualifying uh, feeling about it. Since this is an interview, could I ask you to maybe remember, because you were in the last public performance by Olaville. That's right. In that the, was in uh, Raleigh, North Raleigh, Carolina. North Carolina. So I, I think for the record, it would, might be good for you to recall that. That was, yeah, that's right. Wait, yeah. I feel compelled to point out, I think there's a, a hearty debate between the two of you, you and Dave on this one, but. No. but well, it's in the book. I see Dave's, book. Eye, Dave's <laughs> eyes dad, switching over there, switching dad, over there. So my just, dad, my dad told me that the last, does it really make any difference? To it does. It does make a difference. I mean, but, it really don't to me because my dad told me that the last performance that she done was at the Nazarene Church of Rod's Son. So that's, that's all I know. I think, but I, let, let's say, I, I don't think there's any conflict because no. I think that's true. Yeah. But the one that Hugh was part of yeah. was, was, was a big kind of far away deal. Yeah. So I think that you can have two yeah, last concerts. Absolutely. One, one for the home folks. Yeah. Yeah. And that was not long after she won the American Heritage Award. She right. was awarded that. And uh, she was getting bigger shows. And uh, I think it was sponsored by, uh, I forget who, it was, who, who put the show on, but it was in a theater in Raleigh. And uh, she called me on the phone and said, I'm going we're going down to play this show. You want to go? I was living in Baltimore at the time. This was before I went down to the Southwest. And uh, I said, yeah. And she said, well, come on down to Raleigh. It's right down there. You'll find it. Come on down to the campus. I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> That's characteristic. So I did, though. I went on down and uh, stayed backstage until she, they, they did their main show. I think it was Bud. I think it was just Bud and Olabel. Were you there, Dave? You? Mm -hmm. I wasn't there. But anyway, I stayed backstage, and they did most of their show, and they brought me out for, she brought me out for three or, three or four songs, and then we did, like we did tonight, we did, uh, you know, a gospel, a little bit of a gospel medley together. And uh, as it turned out, that was the last, uh, that was the, the last show of any real significance that she did. Uh, not not to diminish the Nazarene Church, she she did that. Uh, <laughs> she did a couple right. of those. Every show was a show. But uh, she began to have the health issues then, and then she had a a pretty serious episode, and that was pretty well the it. But Olabel was also a, a great influence in my life, not only my life but my brother's life, as far as writing songs. It because she was doing it. You know, in the 40s and 50s, in a, in a setting where old time and, and even in bluegrass, there, there weren't many new songs. You played mainly traditional songs. But she, she was doing, she was writing her own songs, not only in, a, in that period, but as a woman. And I think, uh, thanks to her brother Alex, uh, who, who led the band and kept the wheels rolling and managed everybody, if he said, this is the song we're going to do, it didn't matter who wrote it. But he knew Olabel's songs were good, so he would teach them to the band. The band had to learn them, and they always were successful. <clears throat> but uh, the fact that it was just like regular day to us. I mean, as a kid, uh, writing songs was just something you did. If you felt moved to do it, you did it. And uh, there were lots of writers in our family of various levels of of, uh, you know, out in the public. Uh, my, my mother was first published when she was, I think, 80 years old. But she was always interested in, in writing. She kept a journal every day, and words were important. You know, if you're sitting around the living room and TV or the radio or whatever, you're always bantering back words, wordplay of one kind or another. Now I'm the one, I'm the one rambling on, Dave. No, it's not, you're not rambling a bit. You're doing a wonderful job. Would either of you like to talk about performance at all? I mean, the reactions? And mm -hmm. I think, though, speaking as reactions, when you go to a place, you almost have to um, take the first couple songs and gauge how your audience is. Like, we'll go some places and he'll say, well, we don't, we don't usually use set lists, but we have an idea. We'll, we'll normally start with the first three songs and 
you know, so on and so forth. But sometimes she'll say, no, out here, they really like the little things. <laughs> mm -hmm. Or down here, they really like those hard drive and fast tunes, so we're gonna do those. So you almost, to make sure that you're gonna have a good show, you have to know how they're going to react and mm -hmm. what they wanna hear. And otherwise, you're just going on. Mm -hmm. You know, going with the flow. For me, I think that, like you were saying, Earl Scruggs was in Dublin, Ireland. That was the greatest show for him. For me, the biggest thrill was when we all got to uh, part of the Bluegrass Music Awards, we got to play the Ryman Auditorium. Mm. Oh, see? That's great. The, uh, mother church of <laughs> country music, so to speak. but. To walk on that stage and play. Oh man, uh, that's the, probably the highlight of. We got to play three songs, and that'll probably be the highlight of my life. <laughs> Before yeah. music yeah. can be, you know, when we all got to do that. <laughs> it's the same stage in which Earl got to play for the first time with uh, Mr. Monroe. Amazing. I mean, all talk about the history. Heroes yeah. of yours, yeah. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Lester Flat, Roy Acuff. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, just think of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. At the, the Ryman Auditorium. Yeah, yeah. You know. Great speckled bird. Huh? Uh -huh. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I agree with Danny. I think the Ryman was the highlight. That, well, so you were there? Yeah. Oh, man. TJ. TJ. What's it like Bobby? to stand out on that stage? Yeah. Huh? <laughs> Pretty shocking. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, great. But as they touched on, you know, it's kind of funny, a crowd, or it's maybe an ego thing or a feeling you get when one night you can play same set, a set of songs and get a great response go down the road 100 miles play the same set of songs and it feels like what's wrong oh yeah why can't i get that's, that that's feeling true. that feedback from them <laughs> it always weirded me out a little yeah. bit <laughs> yeah. you know, those big stars talk about a good audience but there's such a thing as a good audience yes. mm -hmm. good audience mm -hmm. feeds the yeah. band that's mm -hmm. yeah. you feed off the band yeah yeah, yeah. 90 percent of the time for me it's a small place Mm -hmm. It's a little folk club, maybe holds 150 people where the crowd's right up yeah. next to you. Not these big music festivals. That, that, They're fun. Yeah. I love them. But uh, they get that real good feel. You have a good PA system and they're yelling songs at you. Mm -hmm. Play this song. and uh, yeah. There's no better feeling. That feeds your ego. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. You come out there walking on, uh, on a cloud. You know? <laughs> and uh, I always say it, tell Ryan, uh, the old cliche, I guess it sounds old, but you know, my job is if I left today, I'm happy. And if somebody else smiled and maybe just made their day a little better, mm -hmm. to me, Job done. <laughs> I'm, feeling, I'm feeling pretty, pretty good. Yeah, you know? that's right. Yeah, yeah. Life is good. <laughs> Can be simple. Job done. Yeah. <laughs> that's a perfect end. I would agree. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.